You are listening to Reach MD, and I'm Dr. Jennifer Cottle, host of Everyday Family Medicine. Joining me today is Dr. Danielle Cooley, Associate Professor at Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine. She is duly board certified in family medicine and osteopathic manipulative medicine. She is also the medical director of the Family Medicine Office in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Today we will be speaking about OMT, osteopathic manipulative medicine and treatment. Dr. Cooley, welcome to ReachMD. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here, Dr. Quattle. So I'm excited to have you here because I, I wanted to talk a little bit about osteopathic manipulative therapy, which is what you are an expert at. Can you first just tell us what OMT, or osteopathic manipulative medicine, is? Sure. So osteopathic manipulative treatment is a way of treating different ailments and different diseases with our hands. And so what we will do is do a very focused structural exam a lot more hands-on assessment of the patient in addition to all the traditional diagnostic and usual assessments of the patient such as muscle strength and deep tendon reflexes and that sort of neurological examination but we also will look very more specifically at different regions of the body and at muscles, joints, bones, ligaments and make further assessments on what we call somatic dysfunction and that's more of a fancy word for a disorder of the musculoskeletal system. And so we will use our information from that then to determine what type of treatments we can apply. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of osteopathic manipulative treatment? How long has it been in existence? And we certainly know that osteopathic physicians do OMT, but are there other practitioners that do it as well? Sure. So it's been in existence since about the 1700s. It was founded by Dr. Andrew Taylor Still, who actually was an MD first and then a DO. And so he was an MD in the, back in the period of time where the medications that we used to treat patients were things like arsenic, lead, mercury, things that we clearly know today are poisonous to the body. And so he had several children who experienced really bad illnesses like spinal meningitis and subsequently died. He had several wives who died from spinal meningitis, and so he was back in the days where he became an apprentice to become a physician. So you worked with under a physician, and once that physician felt you were deemed sufficient enough to be a doctor on your own, you became a doctor on your own. And so his father had been a physician as well. And so he started looking at these type of things, and he thought, this just doesn't seem right. There has to be something else out there, something that is better for patients. And so, coincidentally, he also had some ailments himself, which were primarily migraine headaches. And so, he was a very intuitive and curious person, as most of us physicians are, looking for the answers. So, he actually went and found that if he sat under a tree, and the tree had one of those old-fashioned, which we don't see today, swings on it, hanging from the branches, and if he rested the back of his head against that swing he would end up falling asleep and he'd wake up and his headache would be gone. And so he decided that he needed to start researching this a little bit more. And so he actually used the cadavers or deceased bodies of Native Americans because they were all kind of buried in a hole. And he was out in Kansas City, Missouri. And so he used their body and he started studying the anatomy. Everything in our body is made a certain reason because structure and its function are related. And so he used that philosophy and that concept to figure out different things and how different ways of treating things actually fixed some problems. And so that's kind of how it all transpired. And so he developed the School of Osteopathic Medicine in 1789. This type of medicine has become very popular. It actually arised at the same time of chiropractic medicine. So there was always this confusion, I think, amongst a lot of people about what the two are and what the differences are. And we can absolutely talk about that. Pretty much osteopathic physicians are the only ones that are using it. However, physical therapists have also learned a bunch of manual techniques that are very similar to the techniques that we use. That's very interesting. And OMT clearly has a very long history. Since you mentioned sort of the advent of OMT and how the chiropractic discipline was coming around at similar times, can you tell us the difference between OMT and the discipline of what chiropractors do? I know a lot of people have questions about that. Philosophy-wise, osteopaths believe in four main tenets of osteopathy. That first is that the body is a unit of mind, body, and spirit. So it's not just the body, but it's the mind and the spirit as well that come to take place of a person, and that's how we should focus our treatments. Second thing is actually one I alluded to already, which is that structure and function are related. And then the third 
a philosophy that we believe in is that the body has the ability to self-heal, self-regulate itself, so it can actually overcome a lot of bad things on its own. And then our fourth tenet is that all of those things together, to treat somebody rationally, you take all four of those things together um, to make a treatment plan for the patient. We believe the body works as a whole, And chiropractors, their central believing is that the nervous system is the end-all, be-all. So if you treat the nerves, you will fix everything else. Another difference is that we are full-fledged doctors, so we can write prescriptions, send patients for referrals, we can order imaging studies, and chiropractors have the ability to order some imaging studies, but they don't really have the ability to prescribe medications and do referrals and provide, like, full-fledged care for the patient. Another difference is in the treatment modalities and techniques that are used, Chiropractors are primarily taught stronger or a little more aggressive techniques, which I tend to call high-velocity, high-amplitude, because they tend to do quick thrusting techniques over a large area of space, whereas DOs are trained to do cracking techniques as well. However, ours occur over a low amplitude of space. So ours are a simple flicking of the wrist as opposed to jumping and dropping on the patient or having a table that collapses, which some chiropractors are known to do. In addition to that, DOs are trained to do a lot of different modalities. A lot of them are soft tissue. A lot of them are very gentle. A lot of them are techniques that when you're doing them, the patient doesn't even feel anything happening. We also learn lymphatic techniques. So I think that is pretty much the gist of the big difference between the two. That makes a lot of sense. I think that's very helpful. And I think it's also helpful to note, as you mentioned, that osteopathic physicians are fully licensed physicians to practice medicine and and surgery and DOs who do perform osteopathic manipulative treatment can be board certified in all sorts of disciplines. Is that correct? Dermatology, family medicine, surgery, et cetera? Yes, absolutely. So if you're just tuning in, you are listening to Everyday Family Medicine on ReachMD. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Caudill, and I'm speaking with Dr. Danielle Cooley, Associate Professor at Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Cooley is dual board certified in family medicine and osteopathic manipulative medicine. So, Dr. Cooley, let's continue talking more about the types of conditions that can be treated with OMT. Can you tell us about what conditions doctors can treat with OMT? So, there is actually a very wide range of things that we can use OMT for. What we often see, most often are treating, are patients with musculoskeletal complaints. So, your typical back pain, neck pain, arm pain, leg pain, sciatica, those are some of the traditional ones that if people actually know what a DO is and what they do, they think of those type of treatments. So we can do a lot of hands-on things to treat nerve pain, muscle pain, bone pain, joint pain. But in addition to all that, we also can do treatments for a lot of the different diseases that patients have. For example, a lot of infectious disease things. And we can use our treatments not as solo treatments, but also in conjunction with things. So for example, if a patient comes in with an upper respiratory tract infection that ends up being related to a bacterial sinusitis, we can treat the patient with both antibiotics to help clear the infection, but also we can do hands-on treatment to the head and neck to help with the lymphatics, to help with the drainage of the sinuses, and to help overall the patient's symptoms that are making them feel bad feel better. Things like asthma and pneumonia are great things that we can use to treat. We can even treat patients that have swelling due to CHF or infection. So there's a lot of lymphatic techniques that we can do to help the lymphatic system get moving and help decrease the swelling. And we actually really can treat anybody, which is the thing that I love most about my job is that I can treat babies. So when babies are born, as you all know, the birth itself is a rather traumatic event for the baby to come out of the vaginal canal or to be stuck down in someone's pelvis for the last two or three months. And so the bones of the head can overlap each other and they need to overlap each other in order to get the head out. And so what we can do is actually do a very gentle treatment to encourage the bones to kind of move back into place. And that can help with lots of things in babies, such as those that are having trouble sucking or trouble feeding, those that are colicky, those that are just generally a fussy baby without any other reason. And so we can use our hands to help all of that stuff. In addition, some babies end up having torticollis, and so OMT is a great treatment for that. And then probably my favorite types of treatment are on pregnant patients. So when patients are pregnant, they have a lot of musculoskeletal changes, a lot of ligamentous changes, and really the only treatment that the OBs can offer them is Tylenol and their due date. And so what I, lo- what I love is I can step in there and I can actually do stuff with my hands to help ease their pain and to help make them feel better. So we can really treat quite a variety of things, and we can treat you know, any of these conditions 
such as infectious causes in elderly patients as well. And you also mentioned when it comes to treatment types, when you were talking about some of the differences between osteopathic manipulative therapy and, say, chiropractic medicine, you were talking about the velocity and amplitude and range of treatment styles. Can you speak a little bit to sort of the different ranges of techniques that you can use? Cranial techniques that we would use on someone's head really consist of very, very little motion that's occurring in those bones, so very little motion that's even occurring in our fingers. And if you saw me doing a treatment, you would think, is she doing anything? As the patients often ask me, but then they feel the difference when they sit up. So that's a very gentle technique. We also have a lot of soft tissue and myofascial release techniques. And so what that's doing is working on the soft tissues, working on the fascia that lies in between the muscle layers. And what that does is it helps to release any restrictions there to help free up movement of any of the structures that are in that region, so any of the vascular system or lymphatic system. I did mention we have a bunch of lymphatic techniques that can help with lymphatic drainage and movage of the lymph throughout the body. We also have techniques that actually are called counter-strain techniques. And so what we look at in those techniques is we look at a muscle gets stretched and its way of protecting itself is to quick snap back. And what ends up happening is the muscle that works against it, it's agonist, will end up having a spasm in that. And so the pain actually is coming from the agonist, not from the muscle that was originally stretched. And so we can do techniques where we actually put the patient in its position, the muscle in its position of ease, and that will um, relieve that. And again, that's a really easy technique. You're repositioning the patient in the way the muscle should work, and you know you have the right spot when the patient doesn't feel any more pain. And then we also have some other techniques, the cracking techniques, as I mentioned, which we call high velocity, low amplitude. And then we have techniques that actually require the patient to be able to follow directions, and so they will push against us and do an activating force against the physician. And then there's a bunch of different visceral type techniques that work on the internal abdominal organs. That's fantastic. I think that's a very helpful description of the range of techniques that can be used. I just want you to make a brief statement about maybe some of the evidence or literature that's out there that talks about OMT and OMT efficacy. Overall, in, in the osteopathic world, we obviously are not very good at getting the word out, as many people don't even know what we are. And in research, we also lack there too. However, we do have two very pronounced articles that I think really tied home and hit home for people. There was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, gosh, back in the 1990s, I believe it was now, and it talked about low back pain and treatments for low back pain, and it showed that OMT was very effective in easing patients' pain, and their recovery back to normal was expedited by treatment with OMT. So that's the one of the one of the major ones I often refer people to. And then the other one is actually one that proved our evidence that our cranial mechanisms actually work. And so there was a lot of discussion and people that don't believe in cranial motion. And so they feel that the skull is one bone that's fused together of many separate bones. And we do not believe that. And we can actually feel motion in those bones with a lot of practice and training. The bones have a very, very tiny millimeters of motion. And so the patient's head was put into a vice <laughs> to prevent them from moving. So they weren't able to move their head whatsoever. And they continued to do slices over the same area over periods of time, several minutes of time. And so what they did is they took those images and they measured the diameter of patients' heads. And what they saw was the diameter changed. And so since the patient wasn't able to move, the only thing that could explain the movement is that the bones were actually moving. And so the diameter of the head was actually changed. There's a lot of other articles that are, you know, smaller research articles that will show you how effective OMT is in pregnancy. There was a phase three study that occurred down in Texas that looked at patients' back pain and pregnancy, and what they found was patients' pain was decreased as well as their functional ability was increased if they received OMT treatment during pregnancy. And so this study actually looked at patients receiving routine obstetrical care, patients receiving routine obstetrical care and this sham ultrasound treatment where they just took the ultrasound machine, didn't turn it on, just placed it on different areas of the body for a period of time. And then those at the third group was patients that received the routine obstetrical care and OMT. And there are a bunch of other smaller studies that show the effectiveness of OMT in treatment of asthma, treatment of pneumonia. So there is quite a bit of literature out there. We definitely need to work harder, though, on getting those larger studies to really get the word out there and get the evidence out there to everyone. 
For anyone who's listening, whether they are an MD, perhaps, or having a different degree, are there training programs for people who are not trained in the discipline of osteopathic medicine to learn osteopathic manipulative therapy? Does that exist? The residency programs that exist currently, you have to go through a DO program to obtain a board certification in OMT. That being said, you don't have to be board certified in OMM to perform OMM. There are cranial courses that are open to the public. So pretty much anybody with a degree, there are, I've been at cranial courses where there have been dentists, where there have been MDs, where there have been MDs and DOs from other countries come over to learn that. In order to do and bill OMT, there's not a requirement of a licensure. I don't know that there's a full-scale course available for MDs who want to get back and learn how to do the osteopathic manipulative treatments yet. But I think with the upcoming ACGME merger, we are going to see some type of emergence of those type of programs because you're going to have allopathic students and osteopathic students going into a residency program that maybe originally was osteopathic and will have osteopathic elements to it. And there's going to have to be a way to at least get them at a minimal proficiency level so that they can all be learning and understanding the same thing. Absolutely. Well, that's very helpful as well. As we get ready to close, Dr. Cooley, was there anything else that you wanted to add? Just getting the word out there. I think this is helpful because I think the more we can do to get the word out there about osteopathic medicine, the better off we are. And once you get a set of doctors that know you, whether they're DOMD, it's great because then they start to recognize patients that could benefit from treatments and start sending them your way. So the more we can get the message out there, I think the better we are. Absolutely. Many thanks to our guest, Dr. Danielle Cooley, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Danielle. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Cottle. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Cottle, and you've been listening to Everyday Family Medicine on ReachMD. To download this podcast and others in the series, please visit us at reachmd.com slash everydayfamilymedicine. We welcome you to comment and share this episode.